There's nobody waiting in the lobby, is there? We have our hands up. Stuart, Stuart, yeah. did you have a question? Yeah, I've got just, um, just a quick question. I think the transit net, that sounds, um, that sounds really promising because um, obviously that's definitely something that currently customers are going to need. Mm. You, meant, you mentioned closing the, the, the those decora decorations though, just making sure that the transit is closed and also the customs declaration is closed. Um, what what is the sort of the latest sort of progress on say availability of agents in Europe, if necessary, to, to sort of carry out that process? I, I think the, the the problem is there aren't enough agents anywhere. Um, one of my issues with Europe is that, I mean, years ago when we did this, you, you would do a T form to Leon, <coughs> for example, excuse me, and um, there would be four or five custom stations just around Leon. Um, nowadays, they're all tumbleweed and sort of, uh, you know, that process has moved on. So yeah. what we're finding in a lot of cases is that is that the location isn't isn't authorised for the, it's not an authorised consignee. So whilst there are agents saying, yeah, look, we can clear it, but you've got to go here. And thinking, no, this is a mess. So we, we, we're going to try and cover that off in a minute, though, and when we talk about fiscal rep, because I, I think, I think transit is. We've always said this, really, is transit is the, is the answer to a lot of problems, but it's also a lot of problems. So and and the government, I don't think the government understand it very well. So they tend to sort of latch onto transit completely and go, well, everything will be fine. Transit's the transit's the solution. And it's not really. Yeah, it's only part of the solution, I guess. Yeah, you can't. Uh, it can't do everything, and it does create its own problems. So, uh, okay, well. okay, thanks. Um, thanks. That's all right. No, no, now that I've actually remembered to press record, I can go back to my presentation. <laughs> Sorry. Well, at least I hope I can go back to the presentation. Let's see if I can. Right, we're back on easements now. Can it shout if you can't see that. Where's that there? I don't want that there. Robert, sorry, can I just ask, is that going to be the same for groupage on transit net? Are we going to be able to sort of authorise consign or from the UK and get everything yes. ended at one place? Yes. Yeah, transit net just seems like a, a proper eureka moment for us. We were we were introduced to them via through by Fujitsu as part of the Trader Support Service profiling, really. I mean, they didn't really know what it was either. And we kind of had this conversation with transit net and I thought, oh, here we go. It's going to be some some nutty solution of microwave borders and all that kind of thing. But it isn't. It's just somebody who's taken on the transit issue and said, look, actually, they've got transit guarantees in just about all member states. I mean, Tyler, correct me if I get this wrong, but they're in just about they can cover just about all member states. They've got an enormous, I mean, enormous um, guarantee level. Um, but the the red flag is it's a kind of pay as you go service. So yeah, we we have to use their software to create the uh, the transit the declaration, and the value uh, the the cost of that transit declaration is based on the value. So um, we're we're scoping that at the moment. Look for us if we if we lose some money on this, we lose some money on it. But it, it's to keep things moving uh, it, because it's. Yeah, at the moment you can only just tick as many boxes as you can tick you know and if transit net is a solution but it's gonna it's gonna cost us a bit it doesn't matter let's get the solution in place and we'll worry about the cost later i mean we, we preach that to everybody else there's no reason why we shouldn't preach it to ourselves so. so it's looking like the great white hope i'm just hoping that it still is by the end of the week so uh but it's it's looking too good to be true okay and sorry one more if it's um multiple destinations so benelux and then germany and you've got yeah. to each can you still close it all in belgium nope no, okay. They have to close where they're made to. Oh, okay. That's the issue, really. Thank you. Okay, no worries. Uh, and the other one, uh, if I can make my screen work again, hang on a second. What's happened here? Ah, there you go. The other one, you should have a little cow appearing in the right-hand corner now, or my screen's going wrong. Uh, the other one is GEFs. This is only if you're involved, really, in products of animal origin, and I think it's only products of animal origin. I'm not even sure it's phyto, but the, the government have got have come up with, or DEFRA have come up with something called the Groupage Export Facilitation Scheme. This obviously this only relates to GB export. Um, on the whole, look, GEFs. What GEFs means is that particularly if you're consolidating groupage, um, that you can the trade that sorry the exporter can get a, a, a sort of a a 30 day ad, attestation of uh that allows him to 
almost self-declare the export health certificate. Um, it still requires a stamp. The process is uh, we, we download it. It's on our website. That we, like we distance ourselves from all that stuff, all vet stuff, because we're customs agents, not vet agents. And whenever we, if we put our toe into it, we just don't have enough knowledge, uh, either about the product or, or and we're not involved enough with the trade associations. We certainly speak to DEFRA, but DEFRA are pretty lax in the whole thing. But what we do find is if we talk to a to a food producer about health certificate, they know more than we know because they've been taught to they've been they're in constant contact with their own local vet because they have one. They're in constant contact with their trade association. So as much as possible, we we distance ourselves from this process and let the let the exporter who is responsible for the export health certificate get on with um, arranging the arranging the export health certificate. Otherwise, you just end up with the monkey on your back all the time. Um, even the GEF system, which is the download is on our website, um, even that says draft right the way through it. So you sort of pinning it, all your hopes on a document, an official document that's got draft on every page. But it's out there. Right, we talk about CFSP quite a bit, so I thought I'd just cover CFSP separately because it is the great white hope for uh, imports into GB. So it's important, therefore, to understand what that might look like. So we did this slide some time ago and it, and I think it's I pulled it up last night and I thought it's still really relevant this is that how do you get customs processes into the movement of goods? So if you take the solid line here of the movement of goods, you have an export order, you load the truck, the truck goes to Calais, ships to the UK. At some point there may be a UK vet, a border control post, but not yet. It goes to a warehouse. Uh, the goods the the people in the warehouse, sorry, the, the owner of the goods receives an order and they dispatch that order for ultimate delivery. That goes on tick tock, tick tock every day of the week. OK. And now we're going to introduce customs paperwork, which in a traditional kind of customs agent way would mean me breaking into that thick line in places saying, no, you've got to stop here and do this. You've got to stop here and do that. We've got to stop here and do that one. So it's too much of that stop start process. It doesn't have to be. This is what should be going on in the background. So whilst there is an export, an export order, an export declaration is being created. And I have to say in Europe, we find a lot of traders, a lot of producers are very familiar with raising their own export declarations. Uh, there are some who, who maybe are not. They tend to be more Mediterranean, I have to say. But, uh, but generally in the sort of industrial hinterland, you find that they, uh, the traders are, the, the exporters are, are familiar with exporting. You know, I've spoken to many sort of German companies and said, you're going you're to have to do a document like this. Have you ever seen it before? And on the whole, the response is, oh, like we do for Dubai. And yeah, like that. Yeah, and they, and they, they know the process pretty well. I mean, I would say the majority know the process pretty well, but if you take the majority as being 51%, let's say. So, but there is more knowledge in Europe about exporting to the rest of the world, which we are just about to become, uh, than there is in GB. So, so they have to raise an export declaration, which creates a, an MRN, a movement reference number. In the background, the simplified frontier declaration is being done by the agent, the uh, in the UK agent, GB agent. The ENS is not required yet because it's not required till July. UK IPAS can be done at that point. We're not even in Calais yet, by the way. Um, UK IPAS is done, uh, although that again, that doesn't need to be done until April. Uh, and the GVMS and EPS, we refer to EPS, we've, it's our own invented acronym because we thought we were short on acronyms. Uh, but the GVMS is the Goods Vehicle Movement Service, which is the UK process for collecting MRNs, uh, or, or so, it's like a travel wallet really. And the EPS is just our kind of generic name for export port system. Uh, that might be SI Brexit, the, uh, the logistics envelope in Calais, it might be the Agile border in, in uh, uh, Eurotunnel, it might be RXC port, or it might be port based, for example. We just sort of club those together as the export port system. Whatever that is, that needs to be catered for. So the truck's doing its thing. It's doing pretty much what it always was doing. Just in the background, those processes are going on so that the, the vehicle is Calais ready when it gets there. It then ships to, to UK. Um, the import declaration is updated automatically by GVMS eventually, probably not initially. So it may require a bit of a push from our end. Um, the goods go to the warehouse, the, uh, the goods are, are confirmed as received, entry in declarence records. Okay, That's how you enter in declarence records. You're not too fussed about what you sent, more worried about what you received. 
the goods are then handled as they are normally handled and in the background the customs data is being collated uh, and by the, uh, the fourth working day of the second month or initially six months relaxation the CFSP return is done and the import is closed off. That doesn't sound too bad. You know, like all of this is running in parallel, in tandem, however you want to put it, but certainly under the surface in a lot of cases and should not affect the solid grey line. Um, hence the reason why we kind of drew it up. This has always been our concept from day one is that this shouldn't be a stop start process. It should be running in parallel to the movement of the goods. And and I, I don't see any reason why it shouldn't. One question we get asked a lot as well is what happens to the export when you get to Calais? But honestly, you throw it in the sea. The export, the export is not needed in the UK unless you're on transit, but there's no need to be on transit. Um, otherwise, the export declaration that was raised at the, in the country dispatch, once you get to Calais, it served its purpose. You are now ready to export. And it's worth actually saying it served its purpose. What is that purpose? That purpose is that when you've got goods to export, you first have to put them under customs control in case there's any licensing restrictions and so on and so forth. <clears throat> think, think the kind of Iraqi super gun here where tubes were sent out to Iraq, all looked quite innocuous until they were screwed together and they were a massive gun. Um, so you have to cover that kind of aspect. So you put the goods under customs control. Also, exports are zero rated for VAT. There is no VAT on the exports because they're leaving that customs territory. There is also no reverse charge on VAT anymore. So the goods are leaving that territory uh, and therefore you've raised an export without, or you raise an invoice without VAT as, as the seller. The export declaration becomes the evidence that the goods have left that customs territory, thereby uh, um, re removing your liability to VAT. So when the VAT man comes around and says, Klaus, why did you not? charge VAT on this, Klaus can happily say, here's the export declaration, and here's proof it left through Calais. Job done. So that's how that's how CFSP works. And that's a th that flow here. And and this this whole presentation is is on our website for you to download in the in the members only area, which I'll give you the password. Um that that's a really strong graphic because that's going to be mostly what goes on. Okay. Right, let's do INCO terms. We've always said this needs to be front and centre. On a lot of things, it isn't front and centre, uh, particularly the uh, you know anything from the government because it's it's not owned by anybody. This is you know, the government and border delivery group and, and border and, and protocol delivery group don't really have much say on INCO terms because it's international commercial terms. It's uh, it's it's what agreement there is between the buyer and the seller and what impact that has on the movement of goods. It's typically in in the the difficult. Well, actually, no. The difficulty in in the EU is that trade is already flowing, and then you're retrospectively trying to apply ter inco terms rather than just delivered or collected. Okay? So a lot of people say, "Oh, we delivered duty paid." Well, yeah, but there's never been any duty. Yeah, I know. We just call it delivered duty paid. Would would you if there was duty? No, not really. So the the trader, you can't fix this as a as a logistics provider, this is the trader. The trader has to tell you what to do or how to treat it. If the trader doesn't tell you what to do, there are some absolute showstoppers in this that we can't fix on the fly. Most things, you know, even if something's not quite right, we can kind of get it, get it across the line. If the INCO terms are not well understood, we can't even get it across the line because it can take weeks to resolve the problem that will allow the goods to be delivered. Okay. So let's make sure we all understand what the impact is. We come across this a lot. This now these flags could be either way around. It really doesn't matter. So you've got a guy in Europe who's selling to a buyer in the UK. This is we, this was typically done for supermarkets, for example. Um, the guy, the seller sells the goods on delivered duty paid terms because he wants to keep the buyer happy. The buyer is happy because everything's sorted. They don't have to be involved in the customs paperwork. It's all DDP. The seller has said, look, continue to buy my products. I know duty's just been introduced now at 5%, uh, but you know we've had a long relationship and I'm willing to accept uh, all of that duty or, or at least most of that duty. And the buyer carries on happy as, happy as Larry and the seller sitting there going, well, glad we got that sorted out. We're now delivered duty paid and we've not lost the business. The buyer's not the importer. <clears throat> DDP is a domestic supply. 
very few things will cross the border in a DDP environment because delivered duty paid is after duty has been paid. OK, so it's nearly always post border. So in this scenario, the seller is actually the importer in the UK. So they'll need a UK VAT number and a UK EORI number. They don't need to have a UK company, but they do need a UK VAT agent, which which we are. Um, but we're running out of time here. If we've not already got a, a, VAT, a UK VAT and a UK EORI number for a foreign seller, then we, we're, we're up against the wall to be able to get that in time. We can get an EORI number, a, G, a GB0 EORI number within 24 hours. Um, but it's not related to a VAT, a VAT number. And if there is VAT on the product, the importer, who is this virtual version of the exporter, will not be able to recover that VAT. OK, so they need to prepare early. Um, you don't need a fiscal representative in the UK. Uh, it can be done with this non-liable VAT agent, which is the authorization we've got. But the import entry is done on an indirect basis. There might, there's some relaxation on this that I'm trying to get clarity from the border and protocol delivery group because they don't really understand it. Uh, and there's been conflicting information, three three different versions of this, and they all kind of conflict. But the, the difference between direct and indirect representative on a customs declaration is that if you're a direct representative, you're acting directly for the trader uh, and you are just keying the entry on the information that the trader gave you. If there's anything wrong with that entry um, in terms of the goods are wrongly classified and there becomes a duty liability further down the line, um, you're not liable because you're, you are acting directly. As an indirect rep, you're also you are, you're not solely liable, but you are jointly and severally liable with the trader because the trader is not established in the customs territory where the customs entry has been done. And when we say established, we mean a legal entity. Now, this is where one of the conflicts was, is that when you apply for a VAT number in the UK, you don't have to have a company. You can apply under something called the NETP rules, which is the non-established taxable person. Fine, we've done loads of those. Then you, have, you can only act as an indirect representative of the trader. The trader will say, yes, but I have a VAT number. Therefore, why you can act direct. I go, no, no, we can't because the VAT, you can only act direct if you're established in the customs territory. They go, well, we are on the basis of a non-established VAT registration. So you're claiming to be established with a non-established VAT registration. Clearly you're not. So th there is a red flag here. Customs are trying to issue, to relax it by allowing more agents to work as a as a direct representative. Otherwise, these traders will never find a home. And and also when there are, there's a sh massive shortage of customs agents, there's a massive volume of work coming down the line. There's an awful lot of low hanging fruit. And if uh, and if you're offered, if you're an agent being offered direct rep with no liability, just money for nothing. Well, not money for nothing, but money for keying the entry. Then you're always going to take that one over the indirect rep, which has rolling liabilities. OK, so it's a it's a big issue. Once you've actually done that process and you've you've got the UK VAT and the ORI registration, you then you know the seller actually ships the goods to themselves. So customs is completed, duty is paid, goods are now in UK free circulation, if you like. And only once that's done, does the does the seller does the seller now become the UK seller and provide the goods to the UK buyer? This is why we say DDP is a domestic supply. Okay, is that it's. We, we've seen this process quite a bit I and mean, this happens quite a lot with Ireland and it's worth flagging this with Ireland is that you'll have a supplier in Ireland who will supply somebody in GB the, the nice lady there who's the buyer let's say um, and they they want to go DDP so they create their own identity in the UK they create their their VAT and EORI in the UK and everything's fine and then they send an invoice from kind of themselves to themselves from their Irish self to their UK self and they show the inco terms as DDP delivered duty paid they're not the, the DDP is after that, is after the frontier. <clears throat> if you show an invoice from yourself to yourself on the basis that it's delivered duty paid, the first thing we do before we calculate the duty is remove the duty from the value because it's duty paid, it's duty inclusive. And it's not, people don't mean that. They mean ship it, pay the duty, then charge on a, on a delivered duty paid basis. So watch out for 
a solution where you've got trader to trader, you know, GB or IE to GB or EU to GB, um, and it's showing as DDP. I, I think I think it'd be very, very rare. I, in fact, I'm struggling to find a situation where we would do a customs entry on a DDP basis because deliver duty paid means you put this mitigation in place to make it possible. OK, what, once they've done that, and again, you don't have the, the seller, the EU seller, or, the, or the, and this can work equally in reverse. The EU seller doesn't have their own location or company in the UK, um, but they've now cleared themselves, cleared it into their virtual self, if you like. They then have to charge VA, domestic VAT because it's now a domestic supply from UK to UK. So the EU supplier can continue to use their normal address, their normal logo, their normal everything. Um, but they then, instead of showing the, the the buyer's VAT number as they would have done in reverse charge, they're now showing their UK VAT number and they are in, they are charging VAT because it's a domestic supply. So that process can take, like this whole setup process can take six to 12 weeks and like there's no time left now really. So if, if somebody's not done this, the, the best we can do is get a GB0 EORI number uh, and try and paper over the cracks and and in the background apply for the VAT but it might not be ready on the day so complicated process that this exam we, we did this on a YouTube video um this particular flow got about 2,000 views so it's been people are very confused by this process uh, but you need to get it under your skin because this is the kind of DDP environment also consignment stock environment so you get a lot of situations where uh, goods are delivered from the EU into a warehouse in GB. Uh, they're still the ownership of the of the EU supplier because the UK retailer hasn't ordered them yet. But when they do order them, they want day one for day two. Therefore, the stock's got to be in GB to to satisfy the order plan, the order schedule. Um, and that's what's known as consignment stock. So the goods are held in a sort of mini Germany in the UK. Uh, and again, that that's almost the same as DDP. Well, it pretty much is the same as DDP. So. What we thought we'd do is just sort of go through a resume of what there are seven. There are seven inco terms particularly relevant to Roro, but but there's only really two that you need to flag. Well, three actually. Two that you need to be wary of. The first one is DDP. So in a delivered duty paid environment, the seller is responsible for the export declaration. Happy days, no problem at all. What they might not understand is they're also responsible for the import declaration, the import duty, and the import VAT. As I was saying before driver to a lot of this and hence the reason why they require that um, virtual representation. There is another way which we call DDP Lite. I've also seen it as uh, DAP uh, as DAP including duty and, and DDP excluding VAT. I've seen it in various ways but this is actually quite common in the UK, not very common in Europe I have to say, where you actually have a situation where the, the customs agent sits in the middle. So in, in a kind of DDP light environment, the seller is responsible for the export declaration. The in, um, he's also responsible for the import declaration and the import duty, which the agent does on their behalf. Uh, but the buyer is willing to be the importer. Uh, th this becomes importer of record. This means they've got some liabilities and some responsibilities. But if, if the importer is willing to look after the VAT, which bear in mind they will end up with the VAT anyway, either as a domestic supply or accounting for it at GB import. So they're not, you know, DDP doesn't get them off the VAT. It just means there's a different process of handling the VAT. DDP Lite says the buyer is willing to be named on the invoice as the buyer, is willing to account for the import VAT. The, the, the seller doesn't appear on the, G, on the UK entry other than being the exporter, but the cost of that entry and the cost of the duty is taken by the agent and charged back to the exporter. So DDP Lite has got legs. What's really strange is when the buyer says, oh, I don't want to be the importer of record because there's liabilities attached to that. So they then drop up to DDP rather than DDP Lite. And we've seen many retailers do this. What the difference between the import, the, the buyer becoming uh, the importer of record, um, at, if they don't want to do that, then the agent becomes an indirect rep. So what the buyer is saying is, I don't want this liability. You as an agent can have that liability. So it's a pretty aggressive stance from somebody if they don't actually want to take that responsibility on because then it suddenly flips into indirect rep. Now a third party 
like us, for example, who who don't know them, who doesn't have a relationship with the with the seller, anything like the relationship the buyer does, is now suddenly as liable as the seller is because the buyer won't play ball. So it's a it's not a very friendly solution from UK retailers or UK. Well, it is mostly retailers that the UK buyers to actually just sit there and say nothing to do with me. I just want it this way. I think if they were willing to become the importer, it's very doable. You don't need the VAT registration. You don't need a six to eight week delay. You don't need all this unfamiliar territory for the seller. And the agent just does the, does the documentation and the duty and charges it back. DDP light can be quite handy. X works like we we dealt with delivered as DDP. You then got X works as collected. E X works is the polar opposite of DDP. X works is if DDP is a domestic supply. X works is a domestic purchase. It's very dangerous. X works because in an X works environment, you're you're buying the goods from from the producer, uh, but the producer is not doing any export declaration. And as far as he's concerned, he's just sold it to somebody uh, just so happens you're in England. And it means nothing to them. So in this situation, he he might not want to zero rate it because he doesn't know it's an export. So suddenly he's going to want to charge German VAT on this purchase because you've rocked up to buy something that's not an export to him or her. So the only way you can handle that VAT at the purchase level is to be registered for VAT in the country of purchase. So in an X works environment, the, the buyer potentially requires VAT registration in the country of purchase and is responsible for the export declaration and the export health certificate potentially. So XWorks is a is almost a bigger red flag than DDP. Um, and then once you've done the export declaration, you're then responsible for the import declaration, the import duty and the import VAT as you were as you thought you were going to be. You just didn't think you were responsible as well for the export. So the, the move in on a lot of these, if you go one in from XWorks and DDP, you end up with FCA and DAP. XWorks moves to FCA as free carrier where the exporter is arranging the export declaration and the importer is arranging the import declaration. Happy days, couldn't be cleaner. DAP is a similar scenario, only the freight is paid by the different parties. Uh, so in a DAP environment, again, the exporter raises the export, the importer raises the import, uh, everything's lovely bit of a red flag on DAP, particularly to the logistics sector. If you have a client today where, the, for example, is a GB export uh, and he's your client and you're based in GB, it's probably DAP. Otherwise, he wouldn't be booking you as for the transport. So now you've got a movement of goods from, say, Manchester to Maastricht on a DAP basis. Uh, Everything's lovely. The export declaration is done and you're setting off towards Maastricht to the to the delivery address you always deliver to. Only now that delivery address is an importer. And if that if that guy, if that delivery address doesn't know he's the importer because he thought he was DDP and the exporter thought it's DAP or he has accepted that he's the importer, but he's got no means of paying the duty because he doesn't have a DDA or de deferment account or do DDA is TDA has become a new name for Dan, deferment approval number. So if he doesn't have an account with customs to pay the duty, who the hell's paying the duty? So suddenly you've got this situation where you've collected the goods from Manchester, you've headed off towards Maastricht, towards that delivery address you've always gone to, only that delivery address is now your biggest credit risk. And he doesn't even have an account with you. And and now you're not gonna you're not gonna deliver the goods until you get the ten thousand pounds duty. And your customer is gonna blame you because your customer has known the man in Maastricht all his life. He's the godfather of his oldest son. And it, why are you holding up this good? I know him. I've known him for years. I'll tell you what, switch it to DDP will be the call while the truck is there. You can't. There's the VAT element. So DAP is is a red flag too. The, the only one that isn't is FCA. D, DAP is is a less of a red flag, pink flag, if you like. But and DDP and, and X works require DDP and X works require action. Um, DAP could be a problem and FCA is kind of the the vanilla state of this is how it should work. That when, when there is a problem on DAP um, and you can't deliver because of the duty payment, but you trust your customer more than you trust the delivery address, then you could flip then DDP light is the solution. So suddenly the guy, if the guy in Maastricht is willing to account for the VAT in, in the destination, then you can charge, you can, Arrange the import clearance and charge that and the duty back. Uh, 
The, the big thing about this is it's not a customs process. It's having a massive bearing on what the customs process ends up looking like, but it is international commercial terms. That's what INCO terms are. It, it's, but it's got banana skins all over it for logistics operators. And the amount of calls we get were saying, can you help us do this? Go, what are the terms? What do you mean the terms? It, it's like the old days when you had a when you put a video in the machine or DVD in the well, it's not that old when you put a DVD in the in the in the in the machine and the first question was what language do you want to watch this film in? It's as important as that. It was it's as important as that choice, if you like, is that choosing your inco term is the language of trade that you're going to have now and what impact that will have on the on the logistics operator. It's the it's the biggest thing you need to worry about if you're handling GB exports, for example, or, or anything to, to be fair, is what are the terms and what are you walking into here? And and can that job be completed based on those INCO terms? Look, we say to everybody as well on the trader side is this isn't a customs process. There are ways and means to do this, but the best way to do it is to have a conversation between buyer and seller and tell us what you agreed or tell you what they agreed have a chat but force them down that line most of them don't even know what 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 that means to them <sighs> inco terms is not a great place to start in the morning but hey ho it well we've done inco terms and vat oh sorry we've done inco terms and vat so if you're keeping up you're doing well um fiscal representative um as i was saying to be to have a vat registration in the uk you do not require fiscal representation um because we can act as this uh, non-liable vat agent not so in europe and in fact actually no two member states are the same so if you don't have fiscal representation in europe for example and you're in a kind of a ddp environment then a movement from from the uk to italy for example would require a transit document which has got to be authenticated, it's got to be raised and authenticated in an authorised consignor location. You've got to have VAT in Italy, which is not postponed accounting. VAT is payable at importation, can't be accounted for on your VAT return. It's reclaimed on your VAT return, but you've got to pay it. You're going to need an EORI number. You only actually have one EORI number for the whole of Europe, but you can have loads of VAT numbers under it for each member state. Um, and watch out for that. There's uh, Somebody said the other day is you can't, um, um, one of the retailers was saying to the to the Germans producer, you must have an EORI number in, in Ireland because you're going to supply Ireland. Going, you don't need an EORI number in Ireland. You've already got an EORI number in Germany and they're all in the EU. But in this scenario, OK, you've got you, you've suddenly got a transit to Italy. You've got you've got a truck wandering around Italy, not quite knowing where to clear. You've got to pay the VAT once you find that place. You're going to need an EORI number there to be able to do it. Uh, and the duty has got to be paid there and then. Or equally, if you're going off to Germany or Poland, it's transit, VAT, EORI, duty. Heavy, heavy paperwork, about, the, about as bad as it gets. Uh, if you're going to mainland France, then you may require a transit if you're not intending to clear uh, at the, at, whilst you're crossing the channel. For example, if you're clearing in Rungis or whatever, uh, you then pay the VAT. You've got, again, you need a, a European EORI and you pay the duty. So there's maximum documentation going on here and all of these if they're products of animal origin have also all gone through a border control post to Calais I'm using Calais as a route here because it's the most common obviously but but all of this has gone through a border control post in Calais which is also a bit of a worry because the guy in Italy is not thinking about the border control post who's responsible for booking that how did that happen who's paying for that so yeah when you're when you're in the north of England selling to somebody in Milan the border control post in Calais is not on anybody's radar you know? so it's it's an important one to cover but within this process we've got transit documents raised in the uk which are cumbersome we've got authorized consignor locations whether or not they are an authorized consignor blah 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 and then and then we've got to find an agent then we've got to do this and we've got to do that so there's a lot of stops involved on this this is the this is the biggest blocker and inco terms will have a driver on all of this of course this is a kind of ddp environment if you have a fiscal representative and, and we've hooked up with a company called Avalara that I've known for years, and they do this for Amazon sellers. So they've got a very slick process in terms of representation in 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 non-resident territories. If we have a fiscal representative in France, so the no, actually we don't have the trader has a, a fiscal representative in France, which is their virtual self in France. Um, then the goods are imported by that company that the that company in France. But this is like John Paul's screwdrivers in 
in Sheffield now has no, John Paul's not a good example. It's very French. John Smith's screwdrivers in Sheffield now has John. So John Smith now exports to his virtual self in exactly the same way as we did before. He exports to his virtual self in France, accounts for the VAT in France, which is postponed VAT accounting. So he doesn't need to pay anything up front. And he pays the duty via an agent which charges back to John Smith in the UK. A kind of DDP light environment here where he's also created his own identity in France. He, there's no need for a transit. Those goods can clear on an anticipated pre-lodged French entry while he's clearing the whilst he's uh, crossing the channel. Uh, the duty is charged back to John Smith. And now we've got the goods in France, which is great if the goods are for France. But they're actually in John Smith, France now. They're on the French identity for John Smith. Doesn't matter about the physical movement of the goods here, although they must have been in France. This is why France is always the best solution. Well, not always the best, but it's often the best solution because the vehicle is probably going to ship to Calais. Therefore, France is, is the best place to do this process. Once John Smith France has virtually uh, bought these goods, he, he now supplies anywhere in Europe as a reverse charge, exactly like he does today. So suddenly there's no he doesn't have to charge his, his client in Germany German VAT because it's reverse charge. It's just we just opened Europe up equally if he's going to Spain, he doesn't need any documentation to go to Spain. It's just an EU EU supply with cross border VAT on reverse charge. Look, this is complicated. Who knew all of this was going to come up? The the other thing which is really quite handy is that is that VAT in France is postponed VAT accounting, so you don't pay it at the point of importation. But it's also domestic reverse charge. So it, so the only the only disadvantage of John Smith bringing the goods in and clearing them in France is that now when he supplies these customer in France, he has to charge in French VAT because it's domestic. But in France, this system is re, is domestic reverse charge. So equally, there's no VAT on that. And this is why you might have seen Europa flow going around saying zero rated VAT. It's not, it's not the right terminology, to be fair. It's not zero rated. It's cross border VAT. So and this is how you do it. However, you can't do it. The trader has to do something. And I saw Europa saying, well, you can have a 49 pound end to end customs documentation. The bit they're missing is you've got to be a you've got to have a fiscal rep, first of all, and you've got to have the relationship struck with the fiscal rep. A Avalara is one of the better ones and because they are super quick. We're not getting in the way of this process. We are literally just going to introduce the trader to Avalara, who have a very digital platform to actually handle the process quickly. We can't get in the way. You can't get in the way because this is financial services territory. And in France, that relationship has to be between the fiscal rep and the trader. OK, so there is no opportunity to make any money out of this, which is kind of good because you can't get in the way anyway. OK. It's likely to cost the trader in the region of £300 per month for the fiscal representation and all VAT records to be done in France on a rolling monthly quarterly basis. Um, now, three, yeah, you know, the traders thinking, well, hang on a minute, oh, £3,000 a year, £3,600 a year. That's a lot of money. But it isn't. It opens up Europe to them. Otherwise, they require VAT registration in every, potentially in every member state. And then you require transit documentation to every member state. And then you require a customs clearance agent in every member state. This kills all of that argument. It's not going to appeal to everybody because traders can't get their head around TSP. What makes you think they're going to get their head around fiscal rep? But but there will be chunks of this where that's done. Now, what that means in going back to Stuart's question earlier on is like, do we have enough locations to clear the T form? We don't need to with this. It doesn't happen. The there is no T form. The goods are cleared as they cross the channel and then they're in Europe and they're just distributed exactly like they are today, but from this fiscal rep identity. We're, we're, we've just got to agree the last part of the um, terms with Avalara, but then we expect to have a web page up by about by probably by Monday to actually say this is the process and we want to do a one page flyer on it um, so that people can the trader can see what that 300 pound a month looks like and it isn't a nailed on 300 pounds there are variations to that but that's the conversation they need to have with avalara um the the other side of it is of course if you this may cost you 300 pounds a month but this is what you're going to save in transit declarations and import declarations because you can do it all through one and if you have that truck which is going to belgium and holland and germany it's not going to, it's not going to any of those places it's actually clearing in france under this virtual identity of the trader which is then supplying the other countries so it's a real, real benefit. 
it's kind of one that should have been high up on the on customs agenda, but this is not a customs problem, you know. We're just going to cover customs duties now quickly as well, because this one comes up a lot. Is that um, what are the duty rates? I mean, there's there's actually two places to look in the UK at the moment, which really really confuses people. If you Google UK trade tariff, you look up the commodity code and you look up the duty rates. Uh, that's kind of the wrong place. It's where you have to look today because we're currently using the EU external tariff. Um, so we have to have that website. So UK trade tariff will actually show you what what will be the duty rate on GB exports into EU, because that tariff that you're looking at under, under, under UK trade tariff is the EU tariff. It has to be there until the end of the year. But it's still it's still relevant for GB exports to EU looking UK trade tariff. However, GB imports, you have to look up the UK global tariff, which is a different web page altogether and is rather confusing people. Understandably, the the UK global tariff um, is uh, are the duty rates which the UK will employ in uh, to imports from anywhere, anywhere in the world in the event. Uh, uh, sorry, from anywhere in the world, full stop, and to the EU in the event of no deal. Now, there are seven, probably about 7,000 lines that have a positive duty rate on them. Uh, there's about 4,000 lines that don't. They're just a, a flat zero. The But of the 7,000 lines that have a duty rate, you know, that is, that's a problem, and that's caused a lot of consternation within the market because there's duty, 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 what we're going to do. The... Um, the previous sort of cliff edge temporary tariff that came out uh, way back March, maybe March last year, maybe. Um, actually, I think it was October, actually. That the temporary tariff that came out actually trashed duty rates so that there were only 400 commodity codes that had any duty on them at all. So, so where are we? Are we at the are we at the temporary crash out tariff, which has been parked, or are we at the UK global tariff, which is very similar? to the current EU tariff, but with some simplification and also any duty rate of around about 2% was killed on the basis it was just nuisance duty. OK, so the, the truth lies somewhere between those two. The the, the fact that the it, it probably won't be the UK global tariff, but I'll never stand in court and say that and I won't be held responsible for saying that, is that the chances of it being that UK global tariff are very, very slight. The, the UK global tariff was introduced to aid the negotiation. The, the most significant thing about the UK global tariff was that it was released in May. And th this was for negotiations up to the end of the year. So it was to force it was to force the EU to actually say, look, if you we don't want duty on our products into the EU, uh, the only way we can kind of get you to have that conversation is to also apply duty to imports into GB. So the whole point of it was to actually spark that, and there's still some way to go on that. The, the other thing that, that it does is it also shows the EU that if you don't do a deal with us, these will be the tariffs applied to imports from the EU. And if you do do a deal with us, that deal will be protected by this, this force field of tariffs that will be applied to everybody else. So it kind of has this double edge to it. So it's a very good move by the by the UK, but we are all pawns in a game in a game here, and we've just got to kind of live with it a bit. That you know the smart money is saying that that tariff just won't end up being that tariff, and it's going to have a a fast change at the end of the day. We it, within our own sort of master data layers at the moment, we don't flag what the duty rate is. We just flag whether or not there's, there's duty, because we just know that rate's going to change, and it's going to change at the eleventh hour. So the most important thing about the tariff is that there are two places to look. UK trade tariff shows you the EU, UK EU tariff. The UK version of the EU tariff is the UK trade tariff online. If you want to know what it's actually going to be for GB imports, you have to look up the UK global tariff, which is a different website altogether. Nice and confusing for people. Uh, let's just do the elephant in the room, actually. The elephant in the room is still the elephant in the room. Uh, from the 1st of January, ISPM 15 heat treated pallets are required in both directions. So you can't export unless you're on heat treated pallets. You can't import unless you're on heat treated pallets. It's kind of nobody wants to do this. Um, but WTO, most favoured nation, says that if this is your rule and you don't have a deal, excuse me, you don't have a deal which kills that rule off, then that's your rule to everybody. And if the EU turns around and says, ah, do you know what, your pallets are OK, we've, we've we've known them, we love them, 
uh, the, the Americans, the Canadians and the New Zealanders will say, well, why have we got a V-treated then? So it's not everybody being nasty. It's these are the rules. These are the boundaries of the rules. And at the moment, that's where we're sitting. So let's break for that section because then we're going to get into the detailed granular what goes on at Frontiers. So has anybody got any? Oh, let me, hang on a minute. I need to go back to my screen to see if there's any hands up. Has anyone got any questions at that stage? Oh, that's promising. That either means I've been talking to myself or, or, or I've explained it really well. I hope it's the I hope it's the latter. No hands up at all. No questions at all at this stage. You're happy to press on. <sighs> Drive a hard bargain, don't you? I've got three hours of this. Let me just have a quick drink of water. Hold on a second. I'm actually sitting here watching my mobile phone to see if my own COVID test results come through, which they haven't done yet. What a weird world we live in. OK, no questions. What's the what does that mean? Oh, no, hang on a minute. There is a hand up. Ah, that's better. Come on, then. John Welsh, go for it, sir. Can I propose a comfort break and a coffee? Yeah, do you want five minutes? Well, hang on, let me just go one question first, because Steve Steve Basnett's got his hand up as well. So, Steve, unless you want the same thing, in which case, happy days. <laughs> no, so, so, John, two minutes and I'll give everybody a break. Unfortunately, not. Have you, in terms of all fiscal representations and customs and terming to do with INCO terms, have you got people that we can actually talk to regularly? We're really struggling, so it's not a logistics company's expertise. And our customers are asking us questions which we don't know the answer to. But who do we go to in CCC to help give us guidance? Look, it's, it's really, really technical um, because it, it doesn't tend to come much from customs experience. Um, let me see. Look, we've, we've created white papers on it. L let me see if we can. See, we're concentrating a lot on the actual customs process at the moment, uh, and Inco terms is really specialised. Everywhere you go, it's specialised. So let, let's try and see if we can get a bit more of an FAQ going, and then it would have to be our our, our top guys really, which would be sort of Tyler, Justin, Paul, Rob, or Joe. But it's but they but these are these are questions that have a thousand answers, and they can open up really quickly. So it's almost better like. Like there's, there's, I get quite a few of these questions myself, and it's just like, you know, I've just got a small question for you. Um, Little have told me I'm DDP. Is that okay? I'll go, oh God, how long have you got? You know, so it is one of those where it's a really, really small, light question with about four hours of of, of, of answer. <laughs> you know what I mean? So as much as possible, I want to try and get an FAQ set going. But and so watch this space, can you, Steve? And I'll see what we can do. But let's try and get, let's try and bat it back as much as we can, because we'll all get, we'll all get buried by it otherwise. Brian's got one question, then we'll have that break. OK, I will, I will. go on, Brian. Um, in your in your kind of experience pre um, the common market, um, and this is kind of becoming, this is becoming <laughs> quite, it's, it's, a, it's a regular question from a lot of our customers that obviously our, our core market is into Ireland, um, where most of our customers are not even trading with the EU currently um, and, and kind of the UK and Ireland are the, are the predominant markets. Do you think that, that kind of free carrier would be um, resisted by, let's take Ireland as our sort of main example, do you think buyers in Ireland will resist the free carrier option because they yeah, have a look, duty? Look, I think, I think Ireland... Ireland is almost like a domestic market, really, isn't it? It's, it's so you tend to see, like, like we see, like if you said, like fifty percent of things are delivered, fifty percent of our X works or collected. When you get to Ireland, it's it's a much higher percentage of delivered because it's it's like a domestic market, and you, yeah. when you buy it in a domestic market, the price includes the bloody delivery. You know, I mean, it wouldn't, it doesn't even cross your mind. You know, we we just ordered loads of furniture; it wouldn't cross my mind. I've got to go and get it. You know, so it is. It's just what how it works. So it, it can work, and we in particularly in Northern Ireland, like if it's if it's a delivered price, the the trader support service has been set up that way to cater for that, um, so that so that the duty can be covered by by other parties, you know. So mm -hmm. so I don't think it's a killer. Fabrice, you're accidentally or Ernest, you're accidentally sharing your screen, sir. 
and I can see you have a, an email from Fabrice. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> no problem. Okay, let's take it. Let's take a break. You're now sharing the screen, where I can see myself. So, hey ho. <laughs> let's, go. Uh, let's take a five minute break, and I'll come back to that. But Brian, I will go into that in more detail in the flows, if that's okay. Yeah, sure. Okay. So we'll, we'll take a five minute now, if that's okay. So, let's all sit back down again at quarter two. I'll leave everything running, okay? So you just got to literally pick your mics up again or turn your computers on. So quarter to 11, meet back here, okay?
We all got a coffee and been for a wee. <laughs> what have we got left? What, how much more have we got left to do? Oh, we're going to go into the granular detail on routes. OK, welcome back. Quarter two. Well, it's slightly gone past, actually. There's, there's a few hands up still at the moment. Is that because not they're the same people who had their hands up, so they might still just if we want to put them down. I'll, I'll take it that they've forgotten to put them down. Let's crack on. Hopefully you can see the little elephant in the room. Shout if you can't. Either that or you're all still making a coffee. Can somebody just let me know you're there? Because this is the weirdest thing. Could somebody just... Yeah. Right. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, not everybody. Okay. <laughs> it's the weirdest thing talking to your screen. Never mind. Thank you. Thank you, people. Um, right. One of the things that we wanted to look at, and, and this, these slides will be really, really useful to you going forward, is, is what are the essential elements? We've, we've We've looked at this in a lot of detail. Uh, we've done some a lot of mapping on it and everything. Um, Ireland is the most complicated, so we're going to start there. Um, but let's just map out what they are. So what we've done is we've taken a kind of scientific view of what are all of the processes that are uh, potentially applicable um, with trade between uh, the UK or GB, NI, GB, ROI. Uh, and we're going to go through, I mean, there, there, you would never have all of these, but these are the elements that are potentially uh, relevant. So you have an, uh, an EAD export declaration, which is required to support VAT zero rated invoice, and that's from an ANIORI number to ANIORI number. There's an exit safety and security declaration, which on the whole is auto generated by the EAD process, unless there is no EAD for one reason or another, and that's quite possible on Ireland of Ireland. Particularly if you're moving from NI to GB, for example, there is no export, but there is there is a requirement for an EXS at Dublin. So, so there will be elements. We'll be doing a kind of standalone exit summary declaration. A TAD, a transit document, allows goods to move through a frontier uncleared. Um, the, a, a transit does lots of different things. There's a very handy book called the transit manual it's 800 pages of legal text if you get bored one one day uh, i've read quite a bit of it tyler's read most of it so uh, and I, I bet paul has as well so it, it's it's a complicated process um and there are many variations to it um but it it's sort of golden rule is that you're passing through a customs territory without clearing in that customs territory or at the first touch point of that customs territory Oh, that's probably the best I've ever described it. Uh, GVMS, which is the Goods Vehicle Movement Service, which is the UK's uh, travel wallet system. It's worth noting that this is not necessarily a one size fits all. The GVMS was designed uh, for ports which do not have inventory linking, which is an even more complicated thing to describe. Um, inventory linking on the whole, RORO ports don't have inventory linking, but some of them are seen that there is actually a bit of an opportunity here to raise some money by having inventory linking under the guise of it being more control. So there are some ports that are saying, do you know what, we think we will have inventory linking, which tends to suit container terminals mostly because that is that the inventory linking will control the movement from the ship's manifest to the unloading, to the customs process, to the customs examination, to da 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 da, to the exit gate. So it's everything from ship to exit gate is controlled by the inventory and customs is part of that. Now, Row Row doesn't really suit that because one is it's got wheels uh, and, and secondly, it's not hanging around anywhere. So it just wants to get from the ship to the exit gate as quickly as possible. And GVMS is a good way of doing that. That, that said, when you run an inventory, it's quite easy to turn to the market and say, well, there is an inventory clearance fee of £15 a truck. And this is why some ports might look at it and just say, yeah, we think we'll have more control here, where they're actually what they mean is that looks like 15 quid a truck here. And, and you know what it's like if the ferry company came to you and said, I'm going to put 15 quid on the rate, you throw them out the door. But if suddenly they, this can be um, sort of part of a process through the port, then uh, it's less obvious. 
anyway gvms is this is the most common system uh or it will be once it's up and running which is a uk travel wallet and you put the mrns in the travel wallet to create a gmr a goods movement reference next line down pbn is the pre-boarding notification which is kind of ireland's version of gvms um it's very good it's very similar um, and again, it's uh, you put the, the MRNs into the travel wallet and that gives you a PBN number. The only slight difficulty with Ireland is that you then have to lodge that PBN number on the ferry booking. But I think you also have to do that with a GMR number um, because, of course, there's quite a lot of drop trailers. So you, you've you got to have a system where the the PBN or the GMR is able to move with the truck. And that normally means putting it on the ferry booking. Uh, ENS is the Entry Safety and Security Declaration, uh, which is not auto-generated by anything, where, whereas the EXS is generated by an export. The ENS is not generated by an import because you not, you're not necessarily customs clearing in the in the territory where you're first entering that, that region. For example, if you are delivering to Italy, the ENS is in Calais and the customs clearance might be in Milan. So it, there is no system that self-generates the ENS. Then it's not a heavy document, it's only about sort of 10 data fields, but it is a requirement. So ENS is the Entry Safety and Security Declaration, has to be at the frontier two hours before you are. Uh, GVMS in is the same as GVMS out, it's the UK travel wallet. We only differentiate between the in and the out because it makes more sense later on in what we're describing. Uh, an import entry is required in the import entry. Uh, uh, that can be a port entry, a simplified frontier deck, or entry in declarance records, uh, which you can't use actually in, um, you can't use entry in declarance records at the moment in Ireland, although I've seen on the Revenue Commissioner's site that they are about to release it. Um, and I got all excited thinking, oh, this will be happy days. And, you know, we're just going to take ages to get everybody authorised, but at least we're getting there. But further down on that page, it says that we've only just introduced this and we're we're formulating the details at the moment. So it's, gr it's great, but it's not good enough just yet. So we'll watch this space on that one. Um, phyto, or phyto or EHC is phytosanitary certificate or export health certificate. These are the certificates required for goods that are SPS. I've not included catch certificate in there for my prawn crackers, but equally that catch certificate would live in that space. Uh, traces is the electronic version of the SPS control, really. It's where you record the movement uh, almost on like a, a almost like a custom system where you're recording the movement is going from one to another uh, and what documentation is with it and, and on the whole that's how also how you nominate and notify the border control post ipaps is the uk version of traces which is ready for some goods from the first of january but not most at the moment there's some talk that pet food might have to go into full sps control into gb imports um, because it's an ABP, an animal byproduct, um, there's some representation from the trade bodies that that wouldn't be necessary, um, but that's not yet uh, finalised. But it is exactly the reason why you shouldn't get involved in the vet and health cert side of things is when you get a call saying, will there be requirements on pet food? You, you, you can't say, and the, and the trader is much closer to that situation than you are so you're just giving an opinion and on the whole what, what's the point of that unless it's fact you know uh, border control post is as it says on the tin really that's where you actually pass through the border control post to enter that territory um we've put on there 24 hours notice because the rule is that you require 24 hours notice at the at the border control post uh calais have said you don't you just rock up which is brilliant uh, we're trying to get some sort of clarity whether dublin are saying the same um, LAN and Belfast on the GBNI flows, and, and more in point to that matter, will probably be equally as relaxed as Calais. Uh, it's the Dublin one we're just trying to get a bit more clarity on, so we're working on that at the moment. Uh, and duty, uh, duty. If, if duty is payable, duty is payable. That's absolutely fine. I suppose the biggest point is if it is payable, how the hell are you paying it? Who's paying it? What's the what's the plan for that? You know, do, how many of these traders are going to have? Uh, Oh, it's recycling bin day. Sorry, with the perils of working from home. Uh, the how many of these traders are actually going to have their own direct accounts with with customs? Very slight. If you look at the GB side, we've got we know we've got this duty deferment account, uh, ten thousand pound limit coming through. So that should that will help an awful lot. Uh, in in Ireland, um, not many intermediaries even have a deferment account. They they do everything through through cash on the traders Eori account. So um, yeah, it's worth keeping in mind. Okay.
So that's the extremities really of what is required. And then what we've done, what we've done is we've looked at what are the root variations. Now this is slight, this is mind boggling, but it is the most complicated are the UK Ireland flows. And this has always been a problem with Brexit. Ireland's always been an issue, um, not least because of the, the need for Northern Ireland to keep North and South to keep the borders flowing, but also there's just so many options of how to how to cross from one to the other and through what. So so Ireland is is the most complicated part of this whole process. GB mainland EU, EU to GB is so, so much easier. So anyway, so this is this is heavy, but um, it's it's really worth knowing. And these, as I say, all of this you can download, so you're going to have it on your on your records. Um, th this one is particularly complicated, uh, but don't think that the, the the European ones are necessarily going to be because of it. It's not based on geography; it's just based on frontiers. So we're going to go route by route, and the first route we're going to do is NI to GB. Now, NI to GB, according to the Northern Ireland Protocol, requires an EXS, an exit summary declaration. Excuse me, I have my coffee. Uh, that's what it says in the Northern Ireland Protocol. That's not what Boris's view of it is. Boris's view of it is that it is unfettered access for NI traders into the GB market. So the UK is saying we've got no intention at all of doing an EXS entry summary declaration, hence the reason why we've got it in brackets. Um, the EU don't agree, so the UK legislated for it in the Internal Markets Bill. Um, and that went down like a lead balloon. So that one's now getting loads of issues from uh, the opposition parties saying that it's breaking international treaties and what have you. And the EU is saying it's breaking international treaties. And the UK is saying, so what? We are not doing declarations for goods moving in a UK internal market. There is no risk of those goods going south because they're clearly crossing the water to GB. And what's the point of me notifying you that they've left the customs territory when you're only worried about the things that are in the customs territory and might go beyond the first frontier. So so I get it. I just I think it was always a nonsense that it was in the it was in the uh, Northern Ireland Protocol. But guess what? We're back to WTO, most favoured nation. If Northern Ireland is working in UCC conditions as uh, full as EU customs code, you have to have an exit summary declaration. And if the if the EU say to us that we don't require it, then all worldwide trade where there isn't a deal are also saying, well, why are we doing it? So I get it. And I think the UK has done the right thing by actually saying we're intentionally breaking the law because it removes the problem from the EU. They don't have to break the law. The UK is happy to do it. Happy in inverted commas. So that one's super simple. That's warmed you up. Let's make it worse. So, NI to GB, but going via the south. This is a really odd one. That would require an exit summary declaration at Dublin, for example, because you're leaving the customs territory of the EU and you're leaving it through a member state i.e. I, I, uh, the, the UK are saying that we require a transit document from from Northern Ireland to transit through the Republic and arrive in GB. We're arguing saying, why, why would I need a transit to, to drive from north to south? That's the whole point, isn't it? What the UK is actually saying is, well, we what we need is when it arrives in Holyhead, for example, we know it came from the north. And the only way to know it came from the north is because it's got a transit document. So we're arguing back saying, well, then it would just requires a, a confirmation of status, which is a T2F, if I'm right. Tyler knows more about this than I do, but I'm going to put my neck out and say it's T2F. I'm sure that's what he said. Um, so, uh, but this is, which is kind of a, that's done today on trade between, for example, I see it's a T2L between GB and Cyprus, which is going through international waters to get there. Um, so a bit of a question mark on that one. If it's a transit, I just think it's a ridiculous transit. But anyway, it is what it is. Uh, there will be a requirement for a pre-boarding notification, which will be the, this is why you need the EXS and this is why you need something to put on the pre-boarding notification because you can't have a situation where you've got nothing. So that needs to be on there. Uh, it will also need to be on the GVMS in into Holyhead uh, so that the authorities in Holyhead can see which bits have come from the south and which bits have come from the north and that will be flagged by the GVMS. It's either GVMS is either going to contain a UK customs entry or the details of the transit document or proof of status. There is a logic to this, believe it or not. 
GB to NI, and I've put in, I've put the little logo on there again, which is not the logo. It's a, just an icon rather about the trader support service. Although I think actually it's quite a good logo, but it's not. It's just one I picked off Google. GB to NI is is this is the element which is covered by the trader support service. You don't have to use it, but it's a free service, and your your customers will know it's a free service, so they're not going to pay you to do anything else. Although there is an opportunity to. Uh, charge a fee for the data management because all of this is about data. Everything's about data. So GB to NI requires uh, an entry, uh, an entry summary declaration in NI, an ENS. It requires a GVMS entry to to control that. It's actually more of a GVMS out. Actually, I've put it as in, but it's it's GVMS anyway. Uh, it requires an import entry in Northern Ireland, which is for goods for all goods, uh, where the duty is either. Um, payable because the goods are at risk of going south or not payable if they're deemed to be not at risk. Uh, and full phytosanitary controls. So that's export health certificate, phytosanitary certificate, traces entry. Although you may have seen some documentation saying that they, Northern Ireland was going to use IPAFs because it's part of the UK. The moment I read that, I thought, well, that's nonsense because then if it does go south, there's no traces entry. So it, I th the, the government have already sort of realised they made a bit of a mistake on that one and come back and said, look, it will be traces in NI as well. There'll be a border control post at Warren Point, Belfast, Larne, for example, um, and there will be the payment of duty, which can be recovered if the goods stay north and is paid if the goods are at risk of going south or you can't prove that they stayed in the north, in which case it's deemed that they went south. So that's the kind of, that's the trader support. That's the sort of main journey that the trader support service will look after because that represents about 65% of all trade. Um, the one thing that's become quite clear in this, and that it will do as I go through these, is as much as possible, if you've got goods for the south, ship to the south, and if you've got goods for the north, ship to the north. I know that's not always practical, that's, but if it's possible, it's cleaner in the early stages. The, the slight complication is that um, some often there's diversions on the Irish Sea due to weather, and that's at its strongest in January and February, which is, of course, when all of this kicks off. But if you can, ship to where you're going. Okay. NI, GB to NI via the Republic is why I'm saying this gets more complicated because you've not, you're not going directly to NI. So now suddenly you do need a transit document. We're, we're yet to find out where the heck we can clear that transit document because there is not a, a bank of authorised consignee locations in Northern Ireland. Um, worse still is if you create a bank of of authorised consignee locations or ETSF locations, they're likely to be on the border and you're starting to create a border. So it's, I just don't think it's a good idea. We're, we're asking customs if we can clear it virtually by producing an import declaration 24 hours after the transit. Uh, I think that's really the only way to do it. But anyway, as it stands at the moment, it requires a transit to pass through the south because you're not, you're arriving in the EU in Dublin, but you're not clearing in Dublin and you're wanting to transit inland in the EU. So you, therefore you require a transit document to get there. You need a, a GVMS record to leave GB so that the transit document and the paperwork is lodged. There is no export declaration in GB to NI. There's no export, but there is an import and potentially there is a transit. So the, the GVMS declaration would show the, trans, the transit information and any export declarations to the south. Um, they require a PBN pre-boarding notification because you're coming into the south, therefore you've got to tell them what you're coming in with. Uh, there'll be an, e an ENS entry summary declaration in the south because that's where you're going. Um, potentially there might need to be a GVM, GVMS in into Northern Ireland, but I doubt that's going to happen because there's kind of nowhere to record it. Uh, and there is a requirement for an import declaration in the north, which as what we're saying is that we just do that 24 hours after raising the, the transit. The, the difficulty is knowing where the I mean, stuff is half the time, so where the goods are, because there's no real control. Hey ho, full uh, full export health certificate controls, which at this point would be at Dublin, because you're entering the EU and transiting through the EU. So therefore, you're going to be going through the border control post at Dublin, not in not in the north. That's why it's sometimes a bit easier to ship to the country that you're intending to go to, or the territory that you're intending to go to. Can't say border and in, in this environment, it's all boundary. Okay. softer word apparently. Um, so there will be a border control post that will be in Dublin and there will be duty payable and as I say that's recoverable through uh, proof that the goods have, uh, are, are in Northern Ireland or stayed in Northern Ireland. We we have yet to see what the uh, what the at risk will be. Um, 
the, 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 the smart money is saying there's about 60 percent of products will be deemed as not at risk. And particularly Marks and Spencer's is always used as a bit of an example because Marks and Spencer's are in the north and the south. And if Marks and Spencer's are sending goods to the north, they're for the north, you know, and therefore they shouldn't have to pay duty. And there's even an argument you shouldn't have to do customs declarations. And if they're for the south, then they're for the south. Therefore, you have to pay duty and you have to do customs declarations. That M&S are trying to do it in, in a kind of a bonded warehouse role, which is actually not a very good solution, but it will flush out in the end. So that's that route. ROI to GB, quite a bit easier. It's the sort of flat. This is like the standard EU Brexit model, uh, EU GB Brexit model. So there's an export declaration from from Republic of Ireland. There's an entry summary declaration. Sorry, there's an exit summary declaration which is attached to that. There's the PBN post board pre boarding notification needs to be lodged at Dublin to say that you're you're leaving. So the documents are all controlled somewhere and that export needs to be closed and the PBN is handling that closure. Uh, GVMS into UK arrival, import entry into UK, which, as we said before, can be a simplified frontier declaration on CFSP, exactly as it can be from from France, for example. Uh, you can do full fat frontier declarations, which we're hearing a lot of people are, tr are planning to do and really it's not a good plan. Uh, it's it's mostly suggested by port agents. So, you know, customs clearance agents tend to live by the ports and they like doing port entry. So when a trader picks up a phone to a customs clearance agent in Felixstowe and says, shall I use CFSP? The customs agent in Felixstowe says no, because he, he likes doing port entries. He's set up to do port entries. I just don't think it's a good solution. I often hear the, the customs agents saying, why should I do two entries when I can do one? I.e. they're talking about the simplified frontier declaration and then the full supplementary declaration. The, 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 there's a really simple reason for that is they've got less chance of delaying anything at the border because there's very little information at the border and you've got more time to do the supplementary declaration which means you don't need full frontline custom skills at two o'clock in the morning when there's a truck at a border so it, it really makes sense and i don't understand the resistance in some cases well i understand where it's come from but i don't understand why they're doing it um phytosanitary controls uh traces ipaths border control posts are not required into gb at least into april rolling into july uh but duty may well be payable as i say that could then be on the duty the deferment account of the of the trader Bear in mind, though, that might be DDP, and although these def we'll test this deferment account thing when it comes out to see whether or not we can get uh, a duty deferment account in GB for an Irish trader with a UK VAT number. I, I don't know. I doubt it, but we'll try. Okay. ROI to GB via NI. Look, it happens. It's a route that would require an export declaration in the south, an exit summary declaration in the north, a GVMS record leaving the north which none of this is really in place. Uh, GVMS record coming into GB, which again is not really in place because there are no, there's no friction between uh, NI and GB. So suddenly by pushing that vehicle up through the north, you're actually almost trying to in, introduce friction on that route when it is actually trying not to have any friction. So it's, so it's an awkward one. Um, but but the basics are, are the same. There's an export declaration from the south and there's an import declaration in the north. There's no veterinary controls and there is, sorry, there is an import declaration in the south. Uh, sorry, there is, I'll get this start again. Stop. There is an export declaration in the south and there is an import declaration in GB. That doesn't change by the routing. There is duty potentially payable in GB. What is a faff around that isn't really got a home at the moment is how you handle the exit summary declaration and the GVMS, which doesn't want to be there because NIGB wants to flow smoothly. So it's, it's an awkward one. It's finding its feet at the moment. GB to ROI, of course, you know, imports into the UK are quite soft and simple. Uh, imports into the EU are, are full blown no deal mode. So that's an export declaration in GB, an exit summary declaration, which is attached to it. GVMS record out so that we can close the export. PBN record in so that they can uh, uh, customs clear it whilst it's crossing the crossing the RSC. Um, an ENS summary declaration into Hollyhead, for example. Again, these have got to be two hours before you arrive at the frontier, but in most cases you've got, I mean, even Ken Ryan Lahn is two hours. So in most cases, there's enough slack in there to get that done right the way up to the to the frontier. Uh, there's an import declaration required in Southern Ireland, which at the moment is mostly a full declaration, uh, unless they go to this entry in, dec in declarants records. 
there is a CFSP kind of style in, in Ireland, but the last I looked, and that was not, not that long ago, I got all excited when I saw it, asked revenue commissioners, and they said, no, it's only for goods up to the value of £250, uh, i.e. parcels. So hopefully there'll be some relaxation on that, but there isn't much time left. Um, a relaxation is no good if it comes in December, if there's no time to apply for it and, and be issued with it. So watch this space. Uh, full phytosanitary controls, traces, entry is required, border control post at Dublin and the payment of duty on arrival is uh, is all in that pack. There's quite a few, it might be worth adding transit to that piece as well because there's quite a few external temporary storage facilities, uh, inland clearances really popping up in Ireland now and I know some of you as, as members have got ETSF locations off site. Um, so transit, transit will just get you through the frontier and you then handle uh, you then handle the customs clearance on a consignment basis within the warehouse, so it can be useful. GB to ROI, GB to ROI via NI. Yeah, okay, that one's not brilliant either because it's got an export declaration from the south uh, from GB. That's normal. Well, in fact, this is GB to ROI by any other name. Only it requires a transit document to pass through Northern Ireland to go to Southern Ireland, and then that. Again, open a transit, close a transit. You're now in this situation where you're thinking, where the heck am I closing that transit? Now, and it has to close at, at an approved location, it authorised consignee, so on and so forth. In fact, we'll have a word with transit net on this because the, the one that comes up quite a bit here is, for example, GB to ROI via NI um, and the delivery is Donegal. So you can't have a situation where you're coming in through Belfast, delivering to Donegal. That makes complete sense logistically if you come from north of England, for example, um, if you've got to go to Dublin to close the T form. So so let, let, let us flag that with transit net. Let me just put that on my note a minute. Transit net Donegal, that will make sense to me later. Um, because we do we do need to get authorised consignees in those locations. I doubt whether Transit Net have got it either, but we'll check. Um, full frontier controls again, because this is GB. This is GBNI. This looks like GBNI flow, uh, and therefore it's going to be full frontier controls in terms of phytosanitary traces, IPAPs, blah blah blah. And duty is payable in the south. That's why you need the transit document to get to the south. Okay. Transit. This is the last one on the Irish pack. This is all about, you know, we've, all of those slides have been on the island on, on what should be the simplest part because it's our closest relationship. And yet it's the most complicated because of this sort of NI, you know, in through one, out through the other kind of flow, you know. Um, transit, this one's kind of bunched two together really, but the, the, the point being is that, is, that the, is that when Northern Ireland is dealing with the EU, it's in the EU. So any goods going from Northern Ireland to, to the to the EU uh, on a GB land bridge in this example is an EU EU transit. There is no other documentation. It's EU to EU. Uh, it may require export health certificate, uh, same as the South here. So anything going from the island of Ireland to, to Europe is a transit. The, the border process is depending on whichever route you go. But Ireland of Ireland to EU is a transit. If it's goods, if it's products of animal origin or similar, then that requires um, export health certificates, uh, traces entry on arrival. Um, this is because under EU legislation at the moment, although we understand that's got some relaxation around the corner, is that if you leave the EU to transit GB and re-enter the EU, having done the bridge, uh, you must re-enter the EU through a border control post. Therefore, it requires full documentation. So we wait to see how that goes. But certainly any products from Northern Ireland uh, or, or the South going to EU on transit, no duty payable on destination. Equally, any products coming from the EU the other way, coming to the island of Ireland, whether that's North or South, is transit. Again, health, re health restrictions in the same direction uh, or in the same as before. Um, and there's no duty payable on EU goods arriving in Northern Ireland or Southern Ireland. Equally, if you crossed Cherbourg Rosslare, uh, that would require nothing at all, and you could uh, you, you could drive to the north of Ireland without any documentation, no health controls, no nothing. Uh, equally, Zeebrugge, Dublin is a, becoming quite a popular route. Whew, that's Ireland. Whew. Let's just do the EU, the EU one as well now at the same time. So that that was the one that should have been easy. 
Now let's do the other one, the, the mainland Europe bit, where of course most of the volume is and therefore a lot of the concentration has been. The processes are pretty much the same. There's a slight change in that we've got an export declaration. We know what that is. Or, um, we've got an exit summary declaration. We've got a transit that may be required. We've got a GVMS. We've got ENS. We've got an export. We've got uh, an EU port travel wallet, which is SI Brexit, RXC port, port base or whatever. The sort of GVMS of the other ports, um, which is relevant on arrival or departure. Uh, we've got GVMS in for GB imports. And then we've just broken imports down a little bit here so that we've got FFD as a full frontier declaration as an import. So you're not doing any simplifications, you're just doing full frontier deck. Uh, you've got an import entry, which is we, we're calling here an import entry following a transit movement so that, that that could be anywhere in mainland Europe. And then we've got a simplified frontier declaration CFSP mode of, of SFD and supplementary declaration. Then we're into the health bits and the and the duty again. So same same principle, but we've just been a little bit more granular on the on the process because there is a slightly different process to France. I mean, well, there's only 45 minutes to go, and then we would have actually done three hours on Brexit talking to a computer. Happy days. Uh, we've used the same methodology again. We've uh, changed the table, obviously, because we changed the table, um, and then we've taken it route by route. There aren't so many. So this one is is EU to GB, and this is all really quite simple EU to GB requires and this is anywhere in the EU to GB okay whether it doesn't matter whether it's France going through Calais or Germany going through Calais or Madrid going through Calais or, or anything else this is any EU to GB it requires an export declaration raised in the EU it requires an exit summary declaration um, raised against at the same time if you like um, there's no transit required, don't need that. There's no GVMS you know, out because it's not an export. Uh, there's no ENS required because the UK said we don't remember, don't want that until July, I remember. There's an export port system required, so you have to lodge the export MRNs in the EPS, the uh, SI Brexit, the logistic envelope in Calais, or that might be, you might do it through Eurotunnel on the Agile border system. Uh, we'll circulate details on the Agile border in case you're not familiar with it. Um, GVMS in, so there's a you have to. The UK now wants to be able to know that that vehicle's coming. So that GVMS in could either be the the entry number for a full frontier declaration, or the entry number for a simplified frontier declaration, or in it eventually it will just be the EORI number of the trader if he's if he's got entry and declarence records. So looking a bit like TSP all of a sudden. Um, whatever there is, there's a GVMS in. It's probably not going to work on day one. In fact, I'm pretty much sure it's not going to work on day one. Uh, and therefore, because it's not going to work on day one, that doesn't mean everything stopped. It means everything's going to flow, but nobody quite knows what the hell's going on. Hence the reason why you've got six months to do your import declaration and you've got to actually own up to what you've received. It's all a bit odd, but the good thing is the default position is flow. OK, uh, there's there's uh, no phytosanitary. There's no health controls uh, required in the UK on most goods. There are some like fish and potentially the animal byproducts and things like that. Uh, so there's no there's no other controls if you take the general position. Um, traces I've got in in a flag. I'm never quite sure about this and I get different answers is that you know, in, in my mind, an export from the EU should be done on traces so that there is a control of those goods leaving the EU territory. Uh, I don't think it would matter either way, to be fair, because tra this would be a single leg traces. And no normally traces is controlling the goods going from one to the other, but the UK is not going to have access to traces. So putting a traces movement on a on a shipment from from Austria to go to the UK uh, will, will never kind of close itself down. It doesn't need to go to a border control post and it doesn't need to be recorded when it arrives at its destination. So it's just going to be this kind of loose hanging traces that's why I've got brackets on it we'll try and get a bit more clarity on that one but at the moment it's the logic of it not quite working uh, duty payment in the UK according to the UK global tariff whatever that ends up being I mean even the border operating model kind of said the tariff will be will be issued closer to the time yeah forgetting well not always forgetting but making the point that it was issued in May but it's not going to be the tariff you know so expect those to change if they're going to change they've got to change by mid-November which is incidentally why they pushed the trade talks out again for another month. And they said today should have been the day when we either, we either get a deal or walk away. And already that's kind of been pushed out for another month. So nothing like 11th hour and all that. So EU to GB, pretty slick. Not so good the other way.
GB to to the EU is more complicated. Now, now we've broken this down into two GB to France. Really, what this means is is that if you are if you are well, let's stick on France for a minute because I'm a little bit unsure on Holland. But if you're if you're shipping to to France and delivering to France and clearing in France, the process can be quite a bit easier. So you would definitely have an export declaration raised in GB, which would have an exit summary declaration pointing at Dover, for example. You would you would only require a TAD, a transit, if you were intending to go inland to clear. You require the GVMS to leave. You require an ENS en entry summary declaration to arrive. We've got to put all of that in SI Brexit or the logistics envelope, which is the kind of reverse of the GVMS. So that's fine. Um, there is a, a full frontier declaration. If uh, which can be an anticipated entry as you're crossing the channel, so that it custom, customs cleared whilst you're whilst you're at, under or over the sea, or if you've done a transit, then you might then you will require an import declaration at the destination, which might be Rungis or anywhere or Lyon or Toulouse or whatever. Uh, if you are doing a transit, then you need an import, but if you're not doing a transit, then you need the frontier declaration. Uh, full phytosanitary and health controls exist. IPAS traces the whole shebang. There is just no uh, IPAS. The border control post is in Calais, um, uh, although it's in Boulogne if it's fish, and there is duty payable. So the INCO terms becomes really important. That's kind of the softer version, if you like. To inland EU, it's kind of cleaner, but more complicated. So it's all of what we just said before, export, exit, tr transit now though, because we're going to pass through Calais and not customs clear in Calais. We're going to pass through to customs clear further inland in the EU. So definitely a transit. GVMS, yes. ENS, yes. In Calais, the ENS is pointing to Calais because that's your first entry point into the EU territory. Export port system or, or entry port system, whoever you want to call EPS. So it's definitely all in SI Brexit like before. There is now no frontier declaration, but there is an import entry to close the transit somewhere. Phytosanitary and health controls are at Calais at the first touch point in the EU territory and the duties payable at the destination wherever you're doing the import declaration. We'll, we'll stop for a minute and get some questions on these. Um, which is now a good time to also mention the Kent access permit because all of that last part was about Dover to Calais. So it's quite obviously Kent could be absolutely full of trucks in no time at all. Sorry, I went on a bit too far. Kent could be full of trucks in no time at all because of people that are unprepared, um, trade not right. The, the France have said that if you arrive, look, look basically when you're, when you're arriving in, in Dover, let's just take a full load, you've either got an export declaration and a French import declaration, and that's the two pieces of the jigsaw. So they're the two MRNs you've got. You've got an export MRN. There, is, there are MRNs as well for the safety and security, but park that for a minute. So you've got you've got an export and you've got an import, but that's what you need. That's fine. So they, they've got to be there and they've got to be valid and they've got to be in place. Or if you're transiting, you've just got a transit MRN because you don't have an export and a transit at the same time on the same shipment because you can't have two customs processes at the same time and the transit replaces the export. So you've either got a, a TAD, or you've got an exit, an, an export and an import. If you haven't got that combination, one of those combinations, don't go. So the Kent access permit is to try and stop you trying to get out without any of those, because France have said, if you do arrive in France without those, you're coming back because there's nothing for us to do. And you can't raise a transit in France. There's always some argument about this. You can't raise a transit in France for a transit that started in GB. You've got to go back and raise a transit. So. Yeah, you know, if you if you arrive in Calais without that correct combination, uh, you you ferry. And then I mean, imagine that in the headlines of the press. We sent our food to France; they sent it back. It's going to happen. Just we just got to brace ourselves. So the Kent access permit was was invented, which was started life being called Smart Freight, morphed into Check and HGV. With its full name is Check and HGV is ready for the border or something. I mean, really catchy title. I think. I think they were right to drop smart freight because it wasn't particularly smart, but some basic rules and bullet points about it. It replies to any vehicle over seven and a half ton. It only replies to Kent, although the service is available on, on an advisory level for all other locations. So it will check. It's a series of questions that you can uh, check to see that your vehicle is ready for the frontier. But 
the uh, the process only is only mandatory for anything over seven and a half tons going through Kent. If you try to arrive in Kent without an, a Kent access permit, which is like a QR code, uh, you're going to be fined three hundred pounds. That's now in legislation. That's now in law. This is this is worrying. I sat on a panel the other day, which was uh, a sort of pre-release of this. The the um, in the event of traffic congestion, they will control the 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 check and HGV permit issue. So if if Brock is in place, which is the sort of car park of Kent, if that's in place and everything's getting a bit full up, they're actually going to um, perhaps not issue the permit, and they will give um, my, my, my the hands are going up like mad. I can hear them in, in my headpiece. Uh, the priority is to fish and chicks. So in the event that everything is so snarled up, the priority will be given. The permit priority will be given to. Um, fresh and live fish and day old chicks. That's it. it. It's just worth knowing for now. Let's, there's a bit of time for this to develop. Let's see how it develops. When you do the when you do your submission for the Kent access permit, and if many of you are asking, can we do this? Yes, we can. The difficulty is how do we get it to the driver? So let's we'll work on that. But look, we can do it. But the problem is how the hell do we get the QR code to the driver? So we'll worry about that later. It's not a showstopper kind of thing. When you do your Kent access permit, you get um, basically three status green. You're good to go. Obviously, amber is you will be the driver will be told to stop on route uh, on route in Kent. And that probably means it's not particularly well defined, but that probably means that he's got a transit document, but it's not been authenticated because he didn't get it from an authorised consign or location. So now he's got a trans. He's got a T form and he's driving his way towards Dover. And now he's got to call in at Motis or Mojo or Stop 24 or wherever the hell to to get that T form authenticated. That is, you've got every possibility of avoiding being in that mess. So, you know, Amber's as bad as red, really. Uh, although red is actually saying you can't enter Kent. Red's saying you haven't got you haven't got the right documentation at all. Go and get it, then come back. So green's good to go. Authorised consign or everything's pretty. You've got the export declaration done. You've got the authorised consign or bit done. So the transit's authenticated. You're good to go. Um, so, sorry, or you've got your and or you've got your French entry in place. Everything's packed and ready to go. But there's no reason why that shouldn't be the case. If it isn't the case, you've got to go to an agent. You're going to get a big delay. You might get into Kent, but you're going to be in a pack. And if you haven't got any of those documentation, you won't even be allowed in Kent. And if you try, you'll be fined 300 quid. Um, we've got access to the beta site. We got it just the other day. So that link is also on our website. Um, and that's that will now allow you to go in and actually try and do and you can do live submit live test submissions, if you like, of um, Kent access permit authorization. So have a play. We've, I've had a quick look because I only got it the other day, um, but go on and have a play. See if you can do um, Kent access permits. I'm going to break there for a sec for any questions, then we're going to get into. The last part of the of the three hour epic, which you've all done, you've all done very well, as they say. There's a few hands up. I'll go to Adrian first because it's you know, I had your hand up before, Adrian. How are you? I'm not too bad, thanks, Rob. Nice Thank to you. hear you. Um, sure. just quickly on the KP, uh, we were in the discussion with the guys and we also trialed it. Um, there's a couple of things about it. One, they just ask you if you have got an MRN, so you can actually lie. Yeah. Uh, about it and uh, take the chance of getting caught. Um, but if you haven't got an MRN, it says that you can go in anyway. They'll give you a provisional KAP because you've just got to say you're going either to uh, to uh, you know to a site to pick up your documents or whatever. So it kind of doesn't really solve okay. the it's problem. I mean, when uh, I first when I saw the first launch of it, it was question one is, are you empty? <laughs> and, uh, and and I said, well, show me that. And so they said, he clicks empty and he said, your Kent access permit is this. I said, well, they'll all be empty. And he said, oh, yeah, but they're not all empty. I went, <laughs> yeah, but they say they are. I mean, like, how stupid have you got to be? <laughs> you know? So, uh, you know, a driver knows I, if I press that button that says I'm empty, I won't get fined 300 quid that my boss will make me pay. I'm, I'm empty. <laughs> so, yeah, look, it's not pretty. I, don't, I get I get the logic that they're trying to. Um, trying to prevent Kent getting worse. And to be fair, I mean, Adrian, I know you're in Kent. It, it, it gets horrendous, doesn't it? I mean, it, you can't, 
go anywhere. You can't get anywhere that you want to get to. Know, just it's, trucks it's, everywhere. It's horrible. But I mean, the the other thing that I don't quite understand is how they're going to differentiate between international and domestic vehicles. Oh, you get a, a Kent per you get a, a Kent resident permit, I think, or something. They talked yeah, about that. Yeah, that might be uh, might be a guy coming from the north delivering into Kent, you know, and then going back to the north of England, just purely domestic freight. I don't understand how they're going. You know, they're yeah. actually going to differentiate between that and say a guy who's going out at Dover or Folkestone. Yeah, you and then you've got um, Dover cargo terminal as well, which is now just yeah. cut itself off. You won't be able to get there to pick your bananas up. <laughs> I know. God, okay, let's see how that goes. But I feel for you, Adrian. That's why I moved to help. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, um, yeah. Brian, you've got your hand up again, or is that still up? I reckon that was still not, up. Not gu- yeah, not guilty this time, sorry. Oh, that's right. And and John, you've got the same, or is that just look, we're all good at putting our hands up, but we're not very good at putting them down, unless I can put them down, but I don't think I can. No, I'm, I'm saying to be fair, uh, there you go. I think that's killed mine. Oh, good, okay. Yeah. No worries. Okay, we're nearly there. You've done really well. I mean, we're two and a half hours into this, and who thought you could talk about Brexit for three hours? But um, I hope this is proving to be useful, even if you know the, the, some of this is sort of sweeping over you a little bit. But at least you'll end up with a presentation at the end of it as well. And I think the route guides are really useful, just so you can look in any direction and know what what sort of documentation is required. Hopefully, well, it, well, the fact you're still online and there's st- and there's still 50 of you, so it must be doing something right. <laughs> we just don't know how to exit. Let me uh, go back to sharing the screen. Uh, I don't know if I've done that right now. Can you now see trade isn't about goods, trade is about data? Somebody say something. No. And then I've definitely messed it up. Hang on a second. <laughs> Hang on a sec. Oh yeah, it's got a thing. Click on it. Has that habit? But you can now. Hey. Yeah. All good. good. Okay. Um, this is really, really relevant. Is that it? It is about data. Is that? And this is the hardest challenge in everything that we do at the moment. Is the documentation is the documentation, but we're all going to get buried if we don't get the data right so we've always said to the to the logistics partners in all of this is you get the data we'll do the processing at our end it's not us abdicating responsibility on anything but but if you if you sit there doing customs declarations and there are 200 million of them created by brexit 60 percent of your time is staring at a document or a set of documents trying to find the information you require to do the customs declaration. So 60% of your time is not using your custom skill. It's just trying to find documentation that doesn't require years of customs training to find an inco term on an invoice. You know, I mean, you will find other issues when you when you're fully trained, but it doesn't require that frontline skill, if you like. What's left, the other half of what's, of, uh, uh, sorry, half of what's left when you've got through your 60%, I wish I could do that equation, is is actually repetitive stuff, Name, you know, the URI numbers here, stuff, you know, is what's going here and what's going there. So we want to try and, that's why we're sort of having that sort of master data gathering piece, um, just to try and get as much information as we can. So we, we love this statement. I don't think CJ Cherry is particularly, uh, she's not Einstein or anything, but it's a nice thing, yeah. Trade isn't about goods, it's about data. Nothing moves until data moves them. I like I like it. So what we say about the data, let's just get into the data flows. And this isn't about the master data element, this is more about the transaction data element, first off, is that we can do so much from that one piece of data. So I mean, I know I've been speaking to a lot of you about you know what what um what data do we require? And and you know, do we require the same data for all the different routes? Is is that you just got to get one size fits all. And I know Stuart and I were talking about the other day and just going, it doesn't matter. You've got to have, this is the data pack. If it's going on transit, if it's going this, it's going there, doesn't matter. Don't don't muddy the waters with that. Just ask for a set of data and then all of the processes can be hung off the back of that. And it is literally in its simplest form, we can get data in at one end and create an export declaration, a, a transit and exit summary declaration, an, an entry summary declaration, an import entry. We can do an IPAFS entry, a border control post notification and a traces entry from that one data feed. So it's and pay the duty slipped off to the side there. So 
all of that can be can be sparked off from one slice of data um, and it can all be done pretty much centrally. So it, the, the point is it's all got to be done quickly uh, because there are just huge numbers of transactions. Um, and, and it's not so much, actually, even the sort of high number of transactions isn't, isn't necessarily the issue. I, going back to Ireland again, Ireland's the issue because the geography says you don't have much time here. You know, in most cases, you've got to get documentation done within two hours and stuff like that. Well, it, you know, the geography of Ireland is is you're never far from the port, really. So it's always winging its way towards towards the port where you're up against deadlines. And if you've got a, a full load coming from from the you know the, the east side of Poland, you've got, you've got about a day and a half to get everything done. So you don't have that luxury anywhere else, you know. So um, we're cracking this a lot with robotics because it's it's repetitive. The process is just repetitive and you're also in this situation where if you if you can attract people that are able to do 100 customs declarations a day which is which would be a good number they'll you'll lose them within six months because who wants to sit there doing 100 declarations a day when you've learned when and they're also not difficult declarations yeah it's a full load of yogurt and the next one's a full load of yogurt and there's a full load of furniture and if you've got 10 years experience of doing customs entries and we're just using you like a sweatshop that's just not going to work so the robotics was not so much us just saying well that's how it's got to be i just think that that's how it's got to be our knowledge is much better programming the robotic processes and, that, and that's exactly what the team are doing now i mean tyler was up most of the night um, mapping data flows for the robotics on some some different software we just got hold of i know paul justin's doing it as well for chief entries and paul's doing it for irish entries they're the, you know, these guys are really good at, at mapping that process out. And then luckily we've got a fantastic RPA partner who's not on the call, so I can be, I'm not blowing smoke at him at the moment, but he's been so, so strong in what we're doing. We're using UiPath, which is one of the market leaders in robotics. Uh, there aren't any robots, it's a macro, but but the once we get the mapping, then um, you know David and his team have been fantastic at putting the robotics together. There's still work to do. We're not ready yet, but we're nearly there. Um, the process then looks like this is that we get this is Robbie's root map Robbie is we have to actually give the robots names so this first one's there, there will be about 15 robots by the end might be more than that actually um so the, the first one's called Robbie why not um actually if anybody had got young kids and they used to watch lazy town I think it was it was Robbie Robbie was in that Robbie there was something or other anyway um the what we're saying is get the data to us has got to be fairly standard. Um, we've we've issued a new user guide, which if you haven't gone to our website and got the new user guide, and we did email it out. But if, if you're not looking at version 2.0, which was issued in October, um, you've not got the latest version. It, it is on our website it's in the download section and we've numbered all the download sections now really so that if you have to refer clients to downloads on our website you can refer to it by number just you know just go to that website download document five and you'll see uh, the the template for a supplier's invoice for example so we tried to make things a little bit easier so you can direct people but this user guide's now got the full xml file format in it which we just can't keep things as simple as possible we can't have a kind of an a la carte situation um whereas the, you know this is the data flow that we require if you can't match that data flow don't talk to me, talk to your IT department to try and match that data flow because that's what it needs to look like. We've done it in XML, but we equally that could that shows clearly what the column headings would be if you wanted to do it in Excel or CSV file. So our kind of preferred, if you like, is XML, CSV or XLS. PDF is to be avoided at all costs. It always sounds very sexy. PDF is the, yeah, we'll load the truck and we'll send you a PDF of the invoice. You might as well fax it, to be fair, is that PDF, we've not moved much on from faxing documents. You know, somebody's got to look at it. We could we could OCR scrub it where we've got optical, optical character recognition, but only if it's standard, only if it's the same thing every time. About the only thing that is any good to me as a PDF is an export declaration, because I know exactly I can set the optical scanners off to look in exactly the right direction. So try and get out of this PDF because customers will do it to you. They'll say, like, I'll just, you know, I will load the lorry and we'll PDF it. And that's lovely. I've sent you an email and my job's done, but it's kind of the worst thing they can send you. If they've created a PDF, they've done it with a bit of data. So send us a bloody data, not the document that you that, that data created. You know? But anyway, high horse for a minute. So 
data flows that come in and PDF to be avoided if possible. That then comes into our integration tool, which then passes through a master data filter. We've also got the slick and portal process where we've got the uh, the online uh, web page where you can actually do a customs entry. And I know Tony uh, the, put a coach note to me the other day saying it doesn't. It used to say at the bottom what document do you require, whether you require an EAD and NCTS and all that lot. And it doesn't say that anymore. Um, it's because we thought it was a bit too technical for some people. Obviously not for you, but but it was too technical for the open market. So we've taken that away and we put it back into at the top now. What kind of shipment is this? And we'll decide what documentation is required because we know what the flow is. So we just we just thought people were, didn't know what that terminology meant at the bottom. Um, so we've got the sort of slick process, which th that one's absolutely nailed down at the moment. That's coming in. Uh, that's coming in through website, picked up by robots, generating customs entry. We. Um, it's not re returning any messages to the sender at the moment, so don't be surprised if you don't see anything coming back because that's the last layer we need to do is to now actually return messages to you. It, it, and that doesn't mean it's the last minute layer. It just means we've got to get all the flows coming back into us first and then we push them out to you guys. Um, so it, it's in the plan, but at the moment it's, it's more important that we get the data in customs entry transmitted and back to us at this stage. So we've a lot of concentration on there. We've also got the portal process, which is the sort of more sort of talk through customs entry. So that's on that's on there as well. But all of this is in the user guide. Look, as much as possible, then we everything passes through the robotics. The robotics populate the customs entry. Um, in some cases, they may only have to uh, it may only be semi automated because there's things missing. Uh, and the, the team, the customs team are only there to do customs queries or entries or complicated entries, which there won't be many on day one in Brexit land, uh, but complicated entries where we think it's too much for the robotics to be programmed because there's too many variables. Um, but we're spending most of our time at the moment teaching the customs, the shifts, shift staff that we're bringing in, shift staff that we're bringing in, how to deal with customs queries rather than how to do a customs entry. I mean, I, our idea of doing a customs entry is if we don't have the data, they they fill in the frame that the that the robot wants to do a customs entry rather than going in and doing one. OK, master data is key to this process, but might soften that slightly. And um, when when traders submit master data, they um, they go to our bear in mind our website branding's changed a little bit. So they go to eori.uk data and they follow that process and that's worked very well. We, we've also got tracking on that portal so that we can actually see what comes in. And the problem is some people have sort of circumvented that. So it's a little bit more cumbersome um, because we don't it doesn't if it doesn't come in through the through the portal, it doesn't auto track uh, and therefore we've got to we can only now track it once it's been processed and in our master table. Um, we've been a little bit slow to respond on that, I have to say, because we try not to hit the master table too hard uh, because at the moment we've got a lot of users hitting that master table and the more we hit it to try and do inquiries, the more we create problems. We're actually segmenting it at the moment. It's going to end up on SQL Server where we get more visibility on it or we'll get more structure into it, but we're just not ready to do that yet until we know we've nailed down the final version. But we are working on partitioning the the data in the background so that we can give you better information sooner in terms of who's responding. So we're, we're aware of that failure at the moment. Um, when the data comes into us, um, we need to have product and origin data as well. Um, somebody said to me the other day, do, do it, does it need product codes? Can it just be commodity codes? Yeah, look, that happens. We get quite a bit of that where the customer doesn't actually have a name for the product. That's all he does. So he just gives us the, the the commodity code, that's fine. They can do that. Um, in, in most cases, we've then referred to the product code as the commodity code, so it's doable. Uh, the Save Robbie campaign is only flashing in the background there because we did this on a webinar before and said, look, if we don't get this bit right, the robot's got nothing to do because he doesn't have enough data to do it with. Um, when we receive that master data, we verify all of the codings that have been submitted. We do test entries. Um, for a long time, we seem to be the only person doing test entries because all entry numbers we were getting back were consecutive, which is kind of impossible, you know, but we were getting like it doesn't mean we're the only one actually, but the only one in this particular channel we were using. Um, I know Tyler and Justin were doing them at a previous company as well. So but but we were certainly hitting it with quite a lot of, a lot of entries, but we we formulate what coding we think is the extension to that to that commodity to, you know, for the commodity. Uh, what commodity code is it and what subsequent coding goes with that 
Uh, once we think we got it right, we transmit an entry to, to get customers to confirm we've got it right, and then we lock that in so that commodity code's done. Um, that those tests, and all of that, there's no charge for any of that, no matter who we do it for, because data's good, we need data. Um, so somebody's making a bit of a, is, if you're not on mute, can you mute yourself? Because I can't get back out of this for a minute. Just It's not noisy, but there's somebody certainly adjusting themselves, <laughs> shall we say. <laughs> so uh, once the um, the master data is locked in, we issue a CCC VIP code. Lots of talk at the moment are going, where's my VIP code? Where's my VIP code? Um, we, we will issue them probably about mid-November. You don't need it till day one, and we just want to make sure we've got everything right before we say we've got everything right. So you don't need the code yet. Everyone who submits their data gets a CCC VIP reference, and then we upgrade it to a to a, v, a VIP code ready for day one. Um, it's only kind of a confirmation from us that you've got everything and you're good to go. It's it give us time to just make sure we're doing that correctly because we're now having to put in a certain additional coding into our tables for uh, for CDS layer as well as a chief layer. So which is another customs processing system. Um, so bear, bear with us slightly, we are on it. At, at that point, when master data is lodged and everything's ready and it's all super packed and everything, every commodity is in there, and we've done this with some traders, we can now do test entries and everything's fine and we can do test uh, uh, test data flows and everything's looking good. Um, then they're just ready for day one, really. It's, it's then just a matter of well, what does transaction data look like? Well, what does transaction data look like? It looks like either an XML into ours or, or CSV XLS or, a, uh, or go in through Slick, but you do mostly XML CSV. Um, but the trader might come in through Slick or might come in through Portal. The load data is pretty simplified because we've got a lot of the background information. Although the problem is, as, as Stuart always says to me, we've got to go to the lowest common denominator, which, which is we've got nothing. Therefore, we have to ask it, you know, you're better off capturing all of the data all of the time, uh, at least in the early stages. Then we can work out how to relax that. Because if you if you relax your request for data and they don't give it to you, then we've just just not got the data. Again, our biggest flag in all of this is somebody who's never engaged with you, never sent you master data, never sent it by to you or us, and then on day one says, yeah, it's going there. It's DDP, and we go right. Okay, who's the importer? Well, it's me, obviously. That number and your number? No, it's going nowhere. It just we can't do a customs entry without an importer on it. And if it's DDP and they haven't taken and they haven't taken the inco term step back, I've got no importer to put on an entry. Therefore, I can't do an entry. That's why the inco terms is so front and center. Um, when the load data comes into us, it passes through the master data filter, as I was saying, and the, the, the staff that we got, we can never have enough staff. I don't like the word staff, but you know what I mean. We haven't got of the team to do manual entries because there are too many manual entries. Um, the, so you can only have it that the robotics handles that process and the team only handle the things that don't quite fit the, you know, the square peg round hole and all that. Uh, and our, our, our trick at the moment is to try and reduce the square peg round hole situations. Um, once that data comes in and has gone through, this is our original sort of training slides. This is our software called ASM Segoia, but we've actually got, ooh, we've actually now got four different customs entry software pieces, which is kind of unheard of in customs entry land, but it's, we can't have any, uh, any single points of failure. Um, so that we're doubling up on lines. We've got IT resilience being built in all over the place. We're lifting everything into Azure. What you can see on that screen, if it's working on Teams OK, is that that's that's not us recording what we did. That's the robot just constantly churning out entries. So that's that's in its slowest kind of form at the moment. But the robot, the robot doesn't go, doesn't complete customs entries under the bonnet. It actually just replaces a human. Uh, and just constantly churns out customs entries. The good thing about it is he doesn't need a fag break. He never goes to the toilet and he doesn't want any holidays. And he's quite happy to work 24 hours a day every day. And he can bring his mates in too, because you can have as many robots as you want. And then you just bring a robot in, which uh, 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 distributes the work between the robots. So we can robot just about any level, providing we can map it, we can robot it. Um, what we're doing at the moment is just prioritizing on customs entries, obviously, because that's the bit that needs the most skill. Um, and therefore, and it's also the highest volume. So it, most of the concentration is on that at the moment. But that was certainly the screen in the background there. They're just constantly filling in. We actually don't see that in a real world because it's all happening virtually in, in Azure um, on virtual PCs with 
with data all packed in Azure as well. So we don't actually see it, but if we did, that's what it would be doing constantly. It just means the, the staff, the actual skilled staff can be more focused on making a difference rather than knocking out an entry for full any of it. It's just not the right thing to do. You know? However, what has changed over the last couple of months, because that was fairly utopian solution, is we've now got to manage our expectations. So the first part that we're always after is the header relationship. Like who's the exporter? Who's the importer? What are the inco terms? Put currency to one side at the minute, really, because that should really live in transaction. Uh, what procedure are we using? Is it IPR? Is it OPR? Is it is it a standard import? And have they got a deferment account? So that's our utopia. And then we realised that we're just not getting enough engagement. We've had about a thousand responses from traders. Uh, we really hope we'd have about 20,000 by now. So now we need to start, start to manage our expectations, really, is that it, what we can't have is a, is a situation where we don't have an EORI number at Frontier because everything could come to a grinding halt. So we've got we've got an agency that we're working closely with where we can actually um, search en masse for EORI numbers anywhere in Europe just from addresses. Now, some of you, about three or four of you actually, have already sent me the addresses and we've got a 50% hit success rate on getting those EORI numbers and we will pass those back to you. We're just at the moment just packing it into our system. Um, look, it's free, it costs us, but it's important to us. So. It, because it makes things move more smoothly. So if you have your software at the moment with a whole load of a whole load of addresses on it, which is sort of collection addresses, delivery addresses, or potentially importers and exporters, put them on an Excel, send them to us, and we'll sweep it through the EU EORI checker, um, which will automatically populate a whole load of them. Are they the right EORI numbers? Don't know. Software seems to say it is, but in the absence of the client giving us the right one, what are you supposed to do? If they well, actually in the absence of the client giving you nothing, what are you supposed to do? And and I can't I I can't tell you how many times we get stuck on just the Eori phase of 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 the planning. You know, we have long conversations about how many Eoris we need. You know? So get as the names and addresses, pack them into an Excel. This can be this can be delivery. Bear in mind this will also need to be delivery addresses because that delivery address today is a DAP in a DAP environment is an importer tomorrow. So get as those addresses as well. Okay. Then on transaction level data, so now we're looking for trailer, commodity description, origin, packages, weight and value. The commodity description and origin we should have built in advance, but but let's but we haven't. So what we've done is said, well we have well, we have done. We've done about eight, uh, but no, it's about 125,000 lines now, but it should be a million lines. So managing your expectations has become part of what we're doing. So now what we're actually saying is that if we haven't got the product information from the client. We, you've got to ask for the commodity code and now if we got the commodity code um we can now pack that out from our standard commodity code table this is why we're partitioning data quite a bit in the background to make sure we don't need a product to look up a commodity code so we're just you know doing sort of cross references really um we're li literally doing chapter by chapter through the through the tariff to validate the coding for every commodity code that we can lay our hands on there are 55,000 of them um we don't need all 55,000, but the, but we're just systematically going through it. But but to be fair, we're bringing loads of people in at the moment and that's their training because they've got nothing else to do at the moment because they are data verifiers, uh, which will become shift. They'll become shift staff. So at the moment we need to bring people in. We need to keep them busy. So what we've got them doing is dummy entries for they just literally take a chapter in the tariff and work your way through it and pretend you've got all of these goods arriving. Um, what we're also um, trialing with with Avalara again, who is doing the VAT registrations for Amazon. They also do commodity code assessment for Amazon vendors and they do it with machine learning through artificial intelligence. So we're testing that as well at the moment. So we could have a situation where even if you can't get commodity code, the product description is coming into us and the AI layer will give us a good shout at what we think that commodity code might be. Uh, what we will do in all cases, if we don't have master data, is we'll def maximum. So if there's if there are two commodity, if the AI says, look, it might be this commodity code at 20 percent or this one at 5 percent, it's the 20 percent one. It, it will also say that like, you, you, know, you might actually qualify for a, a preferential rate of duty. Too late, didn't tell us it's going to be full rate of duty. Otherwise, you're going to have trucks stuck at borders somewhere. So we, we use a, a saying a lot, which is which is that the customs entry doesn't have to be right, but it can't be wrong. So in the event of us not having enough information to do the customs entry, we're going to do it wrong from the customer's point of view. From customs point of view, it won't be wrong. 
it will be maxed out so that we're paying everything at the max. And if the customer's unhappy with that, it's recoverable. Um, it's cumbersome, but it's recoverable. But the trucks got through the border and the customer should have given us the information in advance. So we, we, there are some defaults, but we can't what we can't make up is packages weight and value. Or, or, or goods description, OK? Now our download section and our website is really up to date. Um, we don't uh, the download section and the website generally actually is not is not somewhere where we just park stuff that we don't know. It's not a filing cabinet. We actually only put in there what's relevant at the time and the download section is packed with good stuff, including commercial invoice uh, packing list templates, uh, including a white paper on Inco terms. And actually, Steve, going back to your point earlier on, the, the white paper on Inco terms on our website and our associated YouTube video, on the whole, we get really good response to that is that people who didn't who weren't sure about Inco terms have have read the paper and watched the video and and I'd say on the whole they, that's enough for them they, uh, or even if it's not enough the questions the there are questions that come in next are more sensible questions and don't, don't take so long to answer so I think the first wave is always read the paper read the white paper the information paper that we've written on various things but on Inco terms sp specifically read the white paper watch the video and then ask questions and, and that's the problem. It's too easy for customers just to go, don't know, I'll ring them. But they, they need to do a little bit of homework first. I get it. There's too much homework at the moment that they don't know where to focus it. And if they go on the government website, you forgot where you came in and you can't remember where you've ended up. So, it, but our stuff's quite punchy, but the download is, is a really important place to, to hang around, really. Um, this, this presentation and GEFs and the Kent Access Permit stuff is all in the members area on our website. Um, if you don't know where that is, if you go in the custom section and go to consortium at the bottom and then it's got a tab for members area, it will ask you for a password. That's the password, that BBBB1207DD. Um, I'll email it around later on to, um, to members anyway. Um, it, it's all we put in there is stuff that we don't want in, out into the general public at the moment, not because there's anything wrong with it, but there, ha there has to be a, there's got to be a, uh, you know, there's a reason why you're a member of the consortium is you get better information than anybody else. And this information is not generally out there. And we're certainly not, you know, doing a webinar like this to to the, the wider masses, really because it would be too big. O although, to be fair, if, if there's a situation where you feel that this could be beneficial or, or a version of this could be beneficial to your clients, then that we can't do too many because our time is better built programming Robbie but but we could we could set up a, a, a more webinars where you would actually invite clients to it as well because it's all fairly generic we don't we don't mention any particular transport companies um, but we do mention all the processes so that we're, we're happy to do that and, and in most cases we're happy to record them as well because that seems to work you've made it and I can't believe I've done a three hour talk and finished one minute early, <laughs> which is not leaving much time for questions. <sighs> Sorry, hopefully there are none because you've all thought, my God, that was good. Oh, Alan, what do you want? <laughs> Sorry, Alan, don't ask me a difficult question. <laughs> three uh, hours of this. <laughs> yeah, that was great. Thank you, Robert. And uh, good morning or rather good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I've got a simple question, Robert. When uh, are you able to share?